All right, now in Acts chapter 24, of course, this is a, this is a long section of, of chapters here where, where basically Paul's just arrested. And he's just kind of awaiting trial. He's being brought before all these different people. And everyone's like, oh, well, I'll hear him. I'll hear him, you know. And all these unjust judges just just keep him bound. And you saw at the end there, we'll get to that later, because it, it gives the Jews a pleasure. And these guys are nothing more than politicians. They're just trying to gain favor with the majority, with their, with their constituency. And that's all they're doing. And they're not concerned with real judgment or real justice. They're just... They're just pleasing the people, and just saying, okay, well, we'll just leave it about it. Even though there's nothing that he did that was wrong, nothing illegal by any laws, they're just still just pleasing them. But anyways, let's get into the chapter here in verse number one, because, of course, Paul is bound, and he's, and he's, I mean, they're giving him some liberty. It's not like he's just cast in the, into solitary confinement or something, right? I mean, they're keeping him, but, but he's not, like, shackled up or anything. But, but in any case, he's still, I mean, he's still forced to be here so that they could, they could hear him and he could be tried. And in verse number one, it says, And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. So here, they got the, I mean, they got the, the influential people now are coming down to, to, to be there against Paul. And they hired this guy, this orator, right? An orator is someone who's a really good speaker. They, they hire this guy. He's really good with words, right? He's like this chief prosecutor, they, they, this orator named Tertullus. And they came down, the high priest came down, the elders, you know, all these really important people, so called in the, in the, you know, in the Jews' religion, came down with this order named Tertullus, and they're really going to just go to town after Paul. I mean, they're, they're, they're pulling all the stops. They're going to go after him and really try to, try to be persuasive in their argument here. And we, we kind of see this, um, you know, this guy Tertullus is, is you, you, get a, you get an idea for his speech here. Let's see what he, what he does here in verse number two. It says, and when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. You notice how he's just embellishing, he's just, he's just building up um, Felix here. He's just saying, like, you know, we enjoy great quietness. You're such a great ruler. You know, very worthy deeds are done unto this nation because of your providence. And he's using these eloquent words and just really building him up. So this is this order, right? Verse number three says, We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. So he first starts off just buttering this guy up and just, and just really building this guy up. And then in verse number four, Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. Right? That I just beg, just, just give us a few words. Just by your clemency, give us a few words. You know, verse number five, now he's going to really start laying into Paul. And look at the adjectives that he uses about Paul. He says, For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Right? I mean, you talk about exaggeration, right? I mean, you say that this guy, he's pestilent. He's a mover of sedition among all the Jews in the whole world. This guy is behind it. He says, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So he's the ringleader. I mean, you think of, there's all these negative connotations, right? I mean, so he's using, this is the type of guy he's facing, right? I mean, this guy's using all this language and all these words against him. That, that, that are extremely negative. So he's a ringleader, like, like he's this evil guy, and he's just out to destroy all the Jews. And, and this is the, the picture that he's painting of Paul, right? So far, there's, there's no facts being thrown out here at all. This is all just character annihilation. This is all just throwing out all kinds of, of words to make him look really bad without really saying anything. I mean, he's just saying, oh, he's a ringleader, he's against all the Jews. But there's no crimes or no proof of anything just being brought up. He's just basically slandering him. And he's trying to develop this image in Felix's mind of who Paul is. And that's and, and people, this is there's nothing new under the sun. This goes on all the time. People use this kind of language and they try to try to infect your brain against people. And beware of this too. I mean, when people just go around and start using this kind of language and demonize a person. Be careful with, you know, when people just go around saying that and they have, like, nothing to back it up. They have no proof because 
these are the types of things that, that can soil a person's character. I mean, think about this, right? What's a good example of this? And, and he didn't exactly do this here, but, um, you know, all it takes is for a, for a man or, like, especially people in, that are a little bit more popular, a little bit more famous, and really anyone, but when an accusation is brought forth against someone, it's like, that always sticks. You always like even when you're cleared, even if you're going to court and you go, you know, you're found innocent, it's like, depending on how much mud is slung at you, that just sticks in people's heads. That's why, you know, every, every political season and stuff, you have all the ad campaigns and they're just mudslinging and throwing all kinds of bad stuff around because that, they, they hope that some of that's going to stick and stick in your mind. So be aware, I mean, this is the guy using all his words, pestilent, mover of sedition, a ringleader. You know, you, you start to think that this Paul's like a, you know, a really bad guy, just based off of the words he's using here. But again, no factual basis, no evidence whatsoever. It says in verse 6, it says, who also have gone about to profane the temple. And ultimately, that's kind of where their whole grievance lies, is in that one thing. And that was all just an assumption anyway, if you remember. They caught him in the temple... And because he came into town with some Gentiles, they thought that Paul brought them into the temple with them, and even though he didn't do it, he never did. He just went in to purify. I mean, he made a mistake. He shouldn't do what he was doing, but he went in there. He didn't do anything against their law. He didn't profane their temple in any way by bringing anyone in there, but that's what they thought that he did, and that's just what they assumed, and now they're even bringing that to court and just accusing him of it, even though no one has any evidence of it because it didn't even happen. It says, whom we took and would have judged according to our laws. So he's saying, look, we were going to handle this. We, we took him. We were going to judge him as if, like, everything was just taking place fairly. And, you know, they weren't really beating him and about to kill him without, like, giving him even a trial. They, were, they just went about to kill him. No mention of that notice where they said, oh, we would have judged him according to our law. Verse 7, he says, but the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. Uh, yeah, I think you got that backwards. I think you were the ones, you know, doing the great violence there, uh, Tertullus. But you notice how he's just kind of painting this picture saying, oh, yeah, this, you know, the soldiers came in and with great violence, they just, they took Paul out of the, the judgment that we were going to give him, even though they were the ones that were, that were trying to kill Paul. So this is this whole speech that this guy Tertullus is giving. They, they hire this order. He's using all his language and all his words. But ultimately says not much of anything. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 8. It says, um, Commanding his, his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thou thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things, what we accuse him. So he's saying, and then he told us that we have to come here. And in verse 9 it says, And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So everyone actually went with them, you know, because they hired Tertullus, was basically the, the, the person that they prescribed to do all the speaking for everybody. And they're just like, yeah, what he said, that's right. Verse number 10, it says, Then Paul, after that the governor beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for the worship. So basically Paul gets a chance to speak now. So he's saying, well look, I'm glad that you're the one judging this Felix. Because he knows that Felix knows a little bit about these matters. He knows, he's not, he's not unfamiliar with the Jews and, and with their law and with this type of stuff. And he's also saying, he said, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jews. like, I just went there 12 days ago and here I am already. You know, because they're trying to say that he's got the, the, the Jews throughout the world. He's this ringleader, all this stuff. It's like, I just went there 12 days ago. You know, like, how much trouble can he really be causing? You know, they're thinking, he's causing all this trouble, he's putting the city in an uproar. It's like, it's only been 12 days, and most of that time he's been, you know, he's been arrested. It's not like he's even been there very long. He's been, he's been in bonds, he's been, you know, moved to Caesarea, and all this other stuff. He's like, this just happened 12 days ago. You know, like, and they're bringing all this stuff against me. Verse, uh, verse number 12, it says, And they neither found in me, they, never, they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, Neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. He's saying, look, I didn't do any of this stuff. Said, I w they didn't find me in the temple disputing with anybody because he was there purifying himself with the other men. He wasn't causing problems. He wasn't disrupting anything. He wasn't arguing. 
He said he wasn't raising up the people. He said I wasn't doing it in the synagogues or in the city. When I came to Jerusalem, he said I wasn't doing I wasn't I wasn't causing any problems. I wasn't arguing with anybody. And then he goes on and says, you know, they can't even prove it. He said they're accusing me of all this stuff and they can't even prove it. Verse number 14. It says, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So now here we see, he's just going to clear it up for him and say, look, I didn't do any of this stuff they're accusing me of. I'm not causing problems. I'm not causing the disruption. He says, but this is what I did do. What I did do is I, I believe and I preach what they consider to be a heresy. He says, that's what I believe. Right? You know, he believes that Jesus Christ is the Christ. He's the Son of God. They consider that to be a heresy. And he's just essentially just saying, that's, what I, that's why I'm here. That's the whole reason why I'm here is because they think I'm a heretic and they want to kill me. And um, I like what he says here. We're going to dig into this a little bit. Because this is key. In uh, verse 14, he says, after he says, they call heresy, so worship by the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And I love that too, because these people claim that they believe in the law. And they claim that they believe in the prophets. And he's saying, no, I believe all things that are written in the law and the prophets. And this is important because all of the law and the prophets all prophesied of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them, they prophesied of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled so many prophecies. Keep your finger in Acts chapter 24. We're going to come back to it, obviously. But turn, if you would, to Luke 18. We're going to go through a bunch of scripture in the New Testament that all um, explain, and most of them are from Jesus Christ himself, basically explaining that all the scripture pointed towards Jesus Christ. They all preach and prophesy of him. And here's something to do, and I, I was going to do this tonight, but it would take way too long to kind of go through everything. Think about all the books. When you read the Bible, when you read the Old Testament, next time you read the Old Testament, just start thinking about and look for all the places that talk about Jesus Christ. Because they all do. They all do. And it's easier for us, I think, you know, today, with all the knowledge that we have with the New Testament, shining more of a light on those things in the past, but it's amazing how much there is. I mean, we saw, we just saw last week the waters of Meribah, right, on Sunday night, where um, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. And there was a great truth on salvation by grace through faith alone. That was in Exodus, that was in Numbers. We saw in, you know, um, if you go through Genesis, Abraham's faith, it talks, you know, Romans 4 explains that for us. There's so many places that talk about Jesus Christ. You think about Jonah. Jonah prophesied of Jesus Christ dying and going to hell for three days and three nights. The book of Psalms is all you know, full of, of prophecies of Jesus Christ. Um, his soul not being left in hell. Um, all, all throughout the Bible. I mean, it's, it's, it's every one of the prophets prophesied of Jesus Christ. And um, we see this here if you're in Luke 18. Look at verse number 31. It says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So again, there's that word, all things. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man, concerning Jesus Christ, shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. All of these things were prophesied. Everything he just mentioned there in Acts, or Luke 18.31-33 through have all been prophesied in the Old Testament. And he said all those things are going to come to pass. Turn if you would to Luke 24. You're in Luke 18. Just go a few chapters to the right. Luke 24. And verse number 25. Luke 24.25 says, Then he said unto them, O fools! And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is when Jesus Christ met up with the disciples after he was risen again from the dead. And he says, um, 
you know, beginning at Moses and the prophets, he uses that scripture to expound on them, to open it up and be like, look, all of this stuff happened to me. All of this prophecy, I fulfilled all this prophecy. This all came to pass through me. It was all preached about him. Um, jump down to verse 44 of Luke 24. It says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, with all th that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. This is the gospel. Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, right? And this is what he keeps bringing up when, he, when he's trying to talk to the people saying, Look, this is what was written in Moses. This is what the prophets wrote about. This is what was written in Psalms. All these things, all this, you know, the gospel was preached throughout the Bible. And again, salvation has always been by grace through faith in the Christ, in Jesus Christ. That is how salvation has always been. And it's evidence of the fact that it's been preached all throughout the Old Testament. And turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 3. You know what? No, actually, skip Acts 3. I'll, um, I'll read that for you. We already went through that anyways in the in Acts series. But turn, if you would, if you're in Luke, turn to John chapter 5. I'm going to read for you from Acts 3. Acts 3, 18 says, But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The Bible says that ever since the world began, God's prophets preached and prophesied of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I mean, from the beginning of time. God's prophets prophesied of Jesus Christ to come. They all did, and without fail. Every single one of his prophets since the world began prophesied of Jesus Christ to come. It's amazing. I mean, it's, and, and, you know, if that was going on for so long, for so many years, for, you know, it's like, when he actually came, you'd think they would get it. I mean, they had all this preparation, all the prophesying, all the preaching, all the stuff that needed to come to pass. And that's why I think, how amazing would it be after Jesus Christ rises again from the dead for those apostles to, to, to just to have all this scripture all of a sudden now just, wow. I mean, talk about blowing you away. Like, I mean, <laughs> they already saw the miracles and witnessed so many of the, of the amazing things about Jesus Christ. But then after his resurrection, then to just be able to look back in the Old Testament and be like, he totally completed every single aspect of this without fail. That must have been pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's cool today to see that. It's, it's amazing. Um, it says in Acts 3.22, I'm going to keep reading this for you. It says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. This is, that was Moses as a, a quote from the Old Testament. Moses pre preaching and prophesying that Jesus Christ was going to come, a prophet. And he says, you know, a uh, of your brethren, like me, you know, like one of your brethren, he's going to raise the prophet, a, a, a man. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Verse 23 says, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets, from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So all these mentions talk about how much, you know, how every single book of the Bible, all the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. And if you're in John chapter 5, look at verse number 45. Because this was Jesus now rebuking the Pharisees. He says, 
Do not, th do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? And again, it, you know, it's the same thing today as, as, as much as it was back then, where you have people that they claim to believe the Bible. They claim to believe God's word, and they have the right, they can have the right word and the right God, right? They say, no, I believe the Holy Bible. You have a lot of people out there that say, no, I, I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus. The same way that the Pharisees were saying, no, we believe the Lord. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Holy Scriptures. And they had the same Holy Scriptures. That's what they were claiming to believe in, but Jesus Christ called out and said, you don't believe. You claim to believe in Moses and the law. You claim to follow that. That's what you, you pride yourself on is the law. But you don't believe them because if you believed Moses, then you'd believe me. They're preaching the same thing. They're preaching the same truth. It, there, there should be no difference whatsoever. And you got the same thing today with, with, you know, with people who claim to be Christians today. They say, you know what? No, we believe the Bible. That's what we know. We believe it. We believe in Jesus. But they believe that you have to, to work your way to heaven. You have to be obedient to the law the same way that the Pharisees believe. They say, nope, you've got to follow the law. You have to obey the commandments. You have to do, be good. You have to pray. You have to go to church. You have to do all these things. They don't believe. They have a claim to believe the Bible, but they really don't. In their heart, they don't believe it. And Jesus Christ called them out on that there in John chapter 5. But let's go back to Acts chapter 24. I just wanted to point that out here because we see that in, um, in Acts 24, verse 15, where we were, it says, or in verse 14, when he's saying that, look, they call this heresy. And that's what so many people do today, too. People say, oh, you believe in once saved, always saved? Oh, you don't believe you have to do any works? You're a heretic. And they'll call you out and say that, that you believe in heresy. And that you're sending people out. You're, you're giving people a license to sin. You know, I don't know how many times I've heard that before. Because you tell them that salvation's a free gift, not of our works, it's just something you receive by putting your faith in Christ, like the Bible says, like has always been preached in the Bible by God's holy prophets. Yet, you know, the naysayers, people call you a heretic. There's nothing new. They'll, they'll say, nope, you, there's no way. You have to obey the law. You have to be good to go to heaven. And, um, and there's accusers today just like there were back then. But he's saying, look, they call me a heretic, but this is what I believe. And he says, um, I believe everything that's written in the Law and the Prophets. And so do I. I believe this whole book, front to back. And it's actually the people who don't believe in the totality of it all, but they have contradictions in their belief. But, um, you know, we believe all of it. And, um, of course, here he brings up the fact that he believes that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And he brings that up, too, because they also believe in a resurrection. They claim to. They, they believe in that as well. Verse 16 says, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a good conscience, or always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, Neither with multitude nor with tumult. So again, he's explaining what happened. First, he's just saying, look, the whole reason why I'm here is because of my belief, because they think I'm a heretic. But now he goes on and says, look, I was gone for many years. I was away from Jerusalem. He says, I just came to bring alms. I came to bring some money. I came, I came to, to, you know, to help the poor, to help out my nation and to bring offerings. And then he says, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple. He said, neither with multitude nor with tumult. I wasn't causing any problems. He says, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So these people that found him, these Jews from Asia, they weren't even here. They weren't even here accusing him because they hired this guy Tertullus and the chief priests and the elders came down. But these Jews from Asia, who were the ones who even found him in the first place, weren't even there to accuse him. They're just going based off of someone else's story or whatever that, oh, he profaned the temple. And these guys aren't even here to accuse him. And it says um, in verse 20, it says, or else let these same here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. Except it be for this one voice 
that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. So he's saying, look, even in front of when I stood before their council, you know, if, if they're here, you know, tell them to bring any evil that I did. I, when I was in front of them, I didn't do anything wrong either, except for this voice. Because he, you know, if you remember, after the chief captain took him, Lysias took him out of the, you know, from being killed by the Jews, he, he asked him, he, he gave him license to speak, and he started to, to speak unto him again, and they wanted to go and kill him again. And he said, it's just this voice. This is the reason why I'm here. It has nothing to do, I haven't done any evil, I haven't done anything wrong. Verse 22, it says, And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And this is interesting too, because look, he said, okay, okay, I, I've heard both sides. Now when I finally hear, because Lysias also was a party to this, he'll be able to tell me what else happened there that, that you guys aren't telling me as a third party. He says, then I'll know everything. You know, I'll, I'll have heard it all. And it's so straightforward of a case. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing even given here, even on their end. No proof, no evidence. And there's no way Lysias is going to say anything that, that Paul did because he didn't even believe that he should be bound. He's trying to get someone else to help him write a letter to, you know, to tell him. Or no, um, well, in any case, he, he's the one who got the, uh, the soldiers to make sure nothing happened to him and got him there safely and everything because he's a Roman. But um, what I was saying was interesting is that he said, okay, well, when Lysias comes, I'll, I'll just know everything. But he doesn't pass any judgment, and at the end of the chapter, it says that he was there for two years. I mean, he kept Paul bound in prison for two years. You think he might have heard from Lysias in those two years? Basically, he just leaves this, this whole you know, um, trial, and just, it's just undealt with. Um, and this is how he ends it. So he says, uh, I'll know the uttermost of your matter, verse 23. It says, and he commanded a centurion to keep Paul. And to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. So again, he wasn't just cast into a cell and just, you know, just, just, just left sitting there. He, he did give him some liberty, but um, you know, his acquaintances, he, they could come, they could take care of him and do whatever. But um, it says in verse 24, it says, And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So now he hears them separately, right? Apart, this trial's over at this point, basically. Okay, the, the trial's over. You know, the chief priest, we see him just go home, and um, he's keeping Paul held. Well, this guy Felix had heard him. One of the reasons why he had a good understanding of that way, I believe, is because it says here his wife was a Jewess. His wife was a Jew. So he understands a lot more about the culture. He understands a lot more about their laws because of the fact that he's married to a Jew. And um, so then it says, you know, he, he sends for Paul and he asks Paul to come. And he says he heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So now Paul preaches the gospel unto Felix, right? And then in verse number um, 25, it says, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. And answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. So Felix gets scared. Felix hears the gospel. And he understands it. He hears about, hey, judgment is coming. Right? Christ is coming back. And you think about it, When Christ came the first time, he came meek. He came humble. He came to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came as a servant. He came to minister. He allowed all these things to happen. He allowed himself to get beat up. He allowed himself to get mocked and spit out and ridiculed and made fun of and nailed to the cross. But guess what? That's not how he's coming back. He did all that to save the world out of love. But when he comes back, he's coming back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to bring back judgment upon this earth. He's coming back to fulfill his role and to reign for a thousand years on this earth as the king, as the Lord. He's not going to be your minister when he comes back. He's not going to be here just to serve you. He is going to be the one being served. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That will happen when Jesus Christ comes back. And Paul is telling him here of judgment to come. He's telling him of, of temperance and, uh, you know, 
of uh, righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. And Felix trembles. He shakes. That gets him scared. And he's just like, okay, go away. You know, I'll call for you again when I have a convenient seat. He doesn't like to hear that. And this is kind of how my soul wing went out this afternoon. <laughs> a lot of people not really wanting to hear the gospel at all and just, just kind of shut the door. I went back to that neighborhood where that guy slammed that door in our face. And the rest of the neighborhood hasn't been so good either. But uh, So we see this here. Like, now, what I want to point out here is that there's a, there's a movement out there that really wants to focus on, on fear and the law way more than on the good news of the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ and everything that he did. And you got to be careful for this because we need to be balanced in our soul winning. And we see here that this guy fears and trembles, but he doesn't even get saved. Now, nothing against Paul's soul winning techniques whatsoever. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not criticizing this, but what I'm using this as a springboard into, into a, diff, a slightly different topic, but it's very similar, of this movement of people that go out and they focus on this fear and the law and how bad of a sinner you really are. And if you're familiar with the way of the master, it's this, this series that, that Ray Comfort puts out. Now, Ray Comfort is a heretic. Ray Comfort is a false prophet. Ray Comfort preaches a false gospel. Just be that known right off the bat because his salvation... The, what he does, what it's designed to do, he spends, I mean, let's say, let's say he talks to someone for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. He'll take the bat, like 90% of his time just going over how bad people are and how much you're a sinner and how much you've sinned and all this other stuff and spend very little time on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, I mean, his whole focus is on the sin. And then he tells people, no, you have to give up your sins to be saved. You have to be willing to give up all of your sins to be saved. So if, if he's, what he does, he'll talk to people out in the street and stuff, or in Vegas, or Mardi Gras, or wherever, wherever he is. And like, if someone's like drinking, you know, having a drink or something, he'll be like, yeah, you, you can't have that drink and get saved. You have to, you have to, be, you have to get rid of that. You have to get rid of everything. And that is a false gospel, my friend. Jesus Christ came and he paid for all of our sins. Now look, is drinking a sin? Yes. Should you quit drinking? Yes. Is, you know, are all these other things sins? Should you turn from your sins and give them up? Yes. But that is not an extra requirement for getting saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says to be saved. It's one thing. He teaches a false gospel. Now, his movement, like I said, they focus and spend so much time hammering into people that they're sinners. Now, look, I agree. People have to understand that they're a sinner and that there is a judgment to come. That they do deserve help. That is important. People have to understand that they have to understand that there is a fact that Jesus Christ even died in the first place. Why would he come and, and shed his blood for us and go through everything he went through? Why would he do that if hell wasn't real? Or if we didn't deserve hell for our sins, right? I mean, there'd be no point. If we can do it just by being good people, just by turning from our sins and living righteously, hey, why would Christ have to do any of that? You would have no reason for a savior if you didn't understand the fact that you have sinned and you do deserve this punishment. So yes, that's one of the first things I explain to people is that, look, you've sinned. Now, 99.9% .9 of the people will agree that they've sinned and they've broken God's law. It is very rare when you talk to someone that if they're at that point, they're just going to be a liar and say they've never sinned before. God help them because they're, I mean, they've got to get over that hurdle. And no matter what you say to them, if they already have that in their head, you going through the Ten Commandments, that probably isn't going to help them anyways. But, um, you know, you tried, but some of these people will say, I've never lied before. Maybe they've never lied. Okay, have you ever thought a foolish thought before? No. <laughs> See ya. You know, have fun in fantasy land. Um, <laughs> but most, the vast majority of people, 99.9% .9 of the people say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I mean, we all know we're sinners. We've all known we've done wrong. That's not a big deal. You don't have to go through and, and go through each of the Ten Commandments and say, well, have you ever looked at a woman to lust after her in your heart? You know, you're talking to a man and his wife standing right there. Have you? Have you ever done that? You know, like, you've committed adultery, haven't you? You did. You committed adultery with your heart. And just hound people and just get, and this is what this guy does in the way of Esther. I mean, he'll go through all the Ten Commandments. It's like, look, I get I'm a sinner. 
You don't have to point out every single sin to me to let me understand that. Now, I usually just point out and just ask people, look, the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what a sin is? What's a sin? You know, they'll give you an example of a sin and you say, yeah, exactly. Have you done something like that before? Yeah. Okay, well, look at this. And then you show them the judgment. Right? You say, look, the Bible says for the wages of sin is death. You deserve to die for your sins. And you kind of explain, you know, that when it says death, it's not just talking about physical death. You know, I bring in Revelation, talk about hell, talk about the lake of fire, right? It talks about um, Revelation um, 21 8 talks about, um, you know, the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, yeah, you know, you explain to people, look, the Bible says that the punishment for our sins is hell. They have to understand that, but. I don't want to spend the majority of my time just talking about that. That's the bad news. And like I said, the, the vast majority of the people I talk to understand that and they get it. You don't have to just drill it into their heads because they already know it. They already believe it. Now, if someone doesn't believe that they deserve hell for their sins, then that is a problem. And I will spend as much time as it takes to get that person to understand there is none righteous, no, not one. You know, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in God's sight. You know, there's all these different scriptures that you can prove to show that. Now, I mean, I believe a person should get to that point where they understand, okay, look, I, am, I deserve hell for my sins. But most people, like I said before, I mean, most people, they get that pretty quick. You don't need to just, to just continually beat a dead horse and hammer that in. Once they already get the point, hey man, move on, get to the good news, because none of that bad news is going to save them anyways. No matter how, I mean, you could spend all, all the time in the world convincing someone that they're a sinner, that's not telling them how to be saved. Not at all. We need to be focused on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, on the good news, what Jesus Christ did for us. That's what we need to do. And see, that's one, that's one spectrum here of this, of this uh, movement, of this... Um, People who like to, to, to focus on the law and everything else. And on the other end, you've got the lifestyle evangelism crowd. Where they'll just say, okay, we don't go out and talk to people. We just wait, you know, we live just this really good life. And because we're such good Christians, we're always happy. And people will see how, how great of a life we live. And they'll say, they'll come to you and say, I just want to know, how, how do I, can I have what you have? That, and that's what they teach, and that's what they believe. And I'm just like, how often does that even happen? How often do you get people coming up to you saying, I, I just, I see the way you live, and I just want what you have. <laughs> now, does it happen occasionally? Okay, maybe it does from time to time, once in a blue moon. Maybe there is someone that can see a change in somebody and say, oh, wow, what happened? Okay, but God has, has commissioned us to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, not to sit back and just wait and be like, come on, you get to come talk to me because look at how great I am. Look at how good, how good things are going for me, right? And, they just, they, and they're just completely focused on just the positive and how good I am and, I, and, and all this other stuff. Again, horribly imbalanced, right? Now, we ought to be living a righteous life. We ought not to be hypocrites. As I mentioned earlier, you know, in order to get people to, to believe you, and for people to, to want to hear what you do have to say and respect what you say, you shouldn't be a hypocrite saying, oh, well, I believe the Bible, but I do this and this and this and this, you know, and I'm, I'm hanging out at the bar and I'm looking at other women and I'm doing all this other stuff. That's weak. That's a weak testimony. No one's going to want to listen to what you have to say when you're saying one, that you believe in one thing and you're doing something completely different. Okay? So we ought to have that aspect. But... That aspect does not negate the fact that we need to go out and preach the gospel. We need to preach, and the gospel is the good news. Again, I mean, going back to the other point, it's not the bad news. We're not out just trying to convince the whole world that they're just they're sinners. The law does that for us. It's, all, it's already been done. And the law is there as a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ. Now, A lot of times, too, besides the way of the master, you know, that Ray Cumber, that false gospel, where people use this law and this emotionalism to, to get through to people, that's also done with altar calls, even in Baptist churches. And there's, it's 
too much has been, has been put focus and emphasized on these altar calls. And I don't like them for so many reasons. And look, if someone makes a decision to do something great for God, amen, praise the Lord for that. But what I don't like is someone, you know, um, people get all hung up and get, and get into a, an emotional frenzy, just get caught up in a moment, right? They hear some good preachers, they get caught up in this moment, and then so many people will end up thinking they make decisions because they're caught up in this emotions, and then they go out and, and, and nothing's changed, different effort kind of wears off. But that's not even the worst part of the altar calls. I mean, first of all, this isn't an altar. We have a pulpit. You know, the altar is where you go and make sacrifices. We don't, ha we don't, we don't have an actual altar in church today. So if you come up, what I, don't, what I don't like is people coming up and you have a man standing right here. And everyone else comes and then they get on their knees and the man standing right here, and they're getting on their knees before this man. Now, look, I get they're not praying to this man. You know, in their heart, they're praying to God. But I'm going to stay away even from the appearance of people. That does not look good to have a man standing up here and a bunch of people down at, at his feet. That does not, that is not good at all. And um, <clears throat> what also happens with these altar calls is it turns into a replacement for soul winning. Again, because what they do then is they think, oh, well, we're going to get all these people to get saved when we do the altar call. And I talked to people, I, I was talking to a guy on the phone about a month ago, and, and I was asking him his testimony about how he got saved. And, and you know, these people are, he's telling me this story, and he's saying how one day he finally, like, got up and walked down the aisle and got saved at the altar. And, and he said that these people, all the people in church are saying, hey, why don't you go up the altar? You know, why don't you go up the altar? I'm thinking, like, why aren't these people just opening up the Bible and saying, look, why don't you just get saved right now? Forget about walking up to the altar. Just give them the, give them the gospel and get them saved. But they rely on that. See, when you start doing this altar call and say, well, this is the time for salvation. Just at the end of service, when we do this altar call, if you're willing to stand up in front of everybody and just, and just walk down the aisle, then maybe you can get saved. No. No, we need to, look, everybody needs to be talking to each other and giving the gospel. Look, if we get a visitor in here or someone comes in that's, that's not saved, hey, we ought to be, the first thing you ought to do is approach them and talk to them and just and ask them if they're saved. And if they're not, give them the gospel. Don't wait for the pastor to do it. Don't wait for someone else to do it. You do it. You approach them and do it because this, you know, when you rely on things like the altar call, you rely on someone else, it's not always going to get done. I mean, people could come in, if you're just relying on the altar call, they might be shy, they might be embarrassed, they might not want to come up in front of everybody, and they might not ever come back again. And if that person dies and goes to hell, when it could have just taken somebody at the services, walk up to them and just show them how to get saved, maybe they would have gotten saved then. I don't know, I'm just, you know, just an example. You don't want to, you don't want to just be reliant on these, on these other mechanisms. Because the Bible tells us that we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. It's, it's our responsibility to do it. It's not the altar calls. It's not the you know, just the pastors. It's the pastors as well as everybody else's. If you're saved, your job is to go get other people saved. Now, um, we're almost done here to wrap things up. And as I said earlier, of course, making people know that they're sinners is important. It is. We need to do that. And understanding that judgment is coming, it's important also. But once a person understands that, we need to move on to the good news. We need to move on to the gospel. And um, it's the same thing with living a righteous life, you know, with people who do this lifestyle evangelism. Look, I don't even care if you do that, but don't let that be a substitute for soul. Nothing should be a substitute for actually opening up your mouth and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Jude, verse 22 and 23, it says, And if some have compassion, making a difference... And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So you have to uh, deal with people in different ways sometimes. Mm -hmm. Some people, they need that fear. They need to understand that there's judgment coming. Hey, you need to understand, you know, there's bad news here. And they need to use that fear. Other people, you know, other people, they don't need that type of fear, but they need some compassion. They need, they need to, to, to know more about the love of God, and God loves them, and God died for them, and God wants you to be saved. 
And you know, I mean, there's there's people are gonna respond a little bit differently to to the way that you talk to them, and, and you know, you need to be able to learn how to gauge that about people. What what is gonna which scriptures and 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 you know what's gonna be most effective with them, and, and which scripture is gonna pierce through to their heart and to help them understand the good news and to help them understand the, the gospel. And this is what I'll give you an example of this because I've kind of learned this a little bit through my soul winning times. When I talk to someone who's younger, um, teenagers, I'll use an illustration typically of, for uh, salvation of a gift. Salvation's a free gift, right? The Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'll go into, you know, how a gift is free and just kind of just really like break it down stupid simple to like, you know, if I give this to you, you know, but then you have to give me a dollar. Is that a gift? And just, and just go through all these different questions to get them to understand a gift. Because they understand gifts anyways. I mean, they're kids. They're getting gifts for their birthday. They're getting gifts, you know, for other things. They like to get gifts. It's something that they're going to, to, to relate to. So I try, usually try to use that to help them understand the gospel. But a lot of times what I'll do, if I have, say, like a, a, a younger mother, if I notice that someone has children, what I'll tend to do is bring up the fact of being born again and being a child of God. That really hits home with parents, with mothers and fathers that, that have young children. They get the fact that my kids aren't perfect. They're not going to obey all my rules. They're sinners. They're still my children no matter what they do. Even if they commit murder, they're still my children. And, I mean, most of the people I talk to are going to say, and I'm still going to love them. Because they will. I mean, you love your children. I love my children no matter what they do. I love them. Now, I may get upset with them. Our relationship might be strained or troubled. If they get into trouble, they start disobeying me, start doing everything that's wrong. They might have to get disciplined and punished, but I always love them, and I'm never going to kick them out of the family. They're always my children. That hits home with other people who have children, typically, because they're able to get that and be like, oh, now I understand. So once I become a child of God, I'm always his child. Whether I'm good or bad, I'm always his child. Now you want to be a good child, right? You don't want to have to get disciplined and chastised and, you know, get the, have God get the belt out on you. <laughs> you don't want that. But you're still his son, even if he does have to do that to you. And he's still going to take you home when you die. When you die. And this is, these are some of the things that the more you go out and talk to people, you kind of pick this up and, and sharpen your skills a little bit. Because people are different. They're going to respond to different things. Now, it's the same exact truth. So it's the same salvation. It's the same gospel. You know, you still teach Jesus Christ and He is the only way, no matter what. Whether, whether you, you relate it to receiving a gift or whether you relate it to being born again. These are both perfect examples that the Bible gives us to help us as human beings understand the gospel. The Bible talks, if you want to use the born again, go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, Jesus Christ explains to Nicodemus that you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And if you want to use the free gift example, I like using Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Or on Romans 6, 23, um, for all of sin and come short, uh, for the wages of sin is death. Sorry, thank you. Wow, brain, <laughs> just, just stop. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, one of the, a verse I use probably more than almost any other verse in the whole Bible goes, escapes my mind. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, those are, those are great verses you can use to help just explain this great truth. And, you know, on some people, it says, you know, you have compassion making a difference. Others say with fear. Some people might need to hear a little bit more. Some people are a little bit lifted up and proud. Hey, they might need to hear a little bit more about, about the judgment that's coming. And that they're not so good. Other people aren't that proud. They're already pretty humble. They know they've done wrong. And, and they know that there's judgment. They know all this stuff. They need, they need to, be, to be given that compassion. That's, and all that just to say basically, you know, we need to um, be balanced in our soul winning. You know, it's, it's not necessarily one size fits all. But don't focus too much on the negative or too much on, you know, either way. You've got to give the, the, the full plan of salvation. We need to be balanced. And we need to actually go out. Not rely on an altar call, not rely on the pastor, you know, not, um, not wait for people to come to us. 
but approach other people. And we need to spend the most amount of time with that individual in the time that they need time spent with. I mean, there's all different aspects. I mean, some people believe all kinds of different things. And when you have a discussion with someone, you learn that. I mean, some people don't believe in the deity of Christ. So you have to spend more time on that area. But you get these things as you, as you have a conversation with them. So, you know, soul winning isn't just running through a script and saying, okay, you know, and read the verses and then just say, do you believe that? Let's pray. You know, no, you're having a conversation with somebody. You're trying to convince them. You're trying to persuade You're trying to, first of all, just help them understand the gospel and then also to receive it. And people have different hang-ups, whether it be their sin, whether it be hell, whether it be the fact that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, whether, you know, whatever it may be. Spend the time that's needed for that individual person and learn, and learn the scriptures so you can, you can help them and give them as much evidence as possible to help persuade them. Let's finish up the chapter here. We're, we're basically done here. It says and, um, in verse 26, so yeah, he says, basically, you know, Felix trembles, and he says, go thy way for this time. We have a convenient season, I'll call for these. Okay, just, just go away. I don't want, I, the gospel scared me, and I don't want to talk to you anymore. But then it says in verse 26, he hoped also that money should have been given him, of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. So he didn't just completely have nothing to do with Paul after that, but now he's just focused on the money. Now he's just thinking, you know what? And, and how unjust is that? He knows Paul didn't do anything wrong. He just wants the money. He just wants to be paid off. He just wants a bribe. All Paul did was just, just, just throw him some money and then he would have been released. And that's, and that's all he's trying to do. He's just, he just keeps on bringing him by in, in the hopes that Paul's just going to pay him off. But Paul's a righteous man. Paul's not a, one to, to, to give bribes or anything like that. Paul knew he didn't do anything wrong. Verse 27 says, But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Typical politician. Just, just the whims of, of the people. Right? Nothing to do with righteousness. Just, well, I'm going to make the Jews happy, so I'm just going to leave him bound. But um, yeah, next week we're going to see... Um, <clears throat> Paul, once again, pleading his case, <laughs> this time before um, Festus, he just did before Felix, and we're going to see before Festus, and um, we'll go through the whole thing again. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to have the boldness that we need to preach your word. Lord, help us not to get wrapped up in these false doctrines. God, I thank you so much that we have such an arsenal of scriptures through, throughout the whole Bible because we know that, that the, the Old Testament prophets and Moses and, and um, the book of Psalms and all throughout the Bible all preached and prophesied of, of Jesus Christ coming and our salvation by grace through faith. God, help us not to get, to get caught up by these false prophets like Ray Comfort, dear Lord, and and learn too much of their ways um, on soul winning. Help us just to do it biblically and just to, to be able to gain more knowledge and gain more experience, dear God, and that you would just work through us and help us to become better ministers of your word, dear Lord, to help bring people to Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.